So welcome to Digital Asset News to get top stories in cryptocurrency digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, it's all about a follow-up to a story we had covered a couple of days ago where the CCP or the China's Communist Party had shut off electricity to miners residing in China. And we're going to go over and quickly re-examine the Pompliano podcast, which featured Brad Garlinghouse, the Bitcoin mining map and concentration, the hash rate and how it was affected, and finally how the SEC and the U.S. government at large sees China as a verifiable threat as they start to dominate digital currencies. Also, a follow-up to the gold story that we had done just a couple of days ago, where we talked about how people were dumping gold to get into Bitcoin. And the whole thing about this was that people were dumping gold, and it wasn't just physical gold, it was ETFs. But we're going to take a look at Raul Powell when he's talking here to Michael Saylor, where he pretty much states exactly that it was physical gold on top of subscribers who are gold owners who have said that they are doing that exact thing, which is dumping gold. And lastly, I'll tell you a quick story about how I lost 20,000 Cardano. And we'll go over all that, but first, let's go on the market. So tonight, it is December 3rd. It was 6.50 at night. And yes, I'm recording this before tomorrow. And the reason for that is we are leaving Houston, going back to El Paso, Texas uh, for businesses and whatnot. So we have to uh, take a, a day long trip, which is about uh, 10, 11 hours. And uh, I just wanted to pre-record something for tomorrow's video. So tomorrow, Bitcoin could be up to 20,000 or it could be at zero. I'm just kidding, it's not one at zero. But right now, on a uh, risk Thursday night, we're looking at 19.5. It's up 1.6 and 14% for the week. And again, we had just looked at a story about PayPal, how they were buying up Bitcoin at a massive rate on top of Square, on top of Grayscale. And that's just those those guys, not to mention the uh, retail investors. So I just don't see how this price can go down in any way, shape, or form. Also, Ethereum 2.0 is uh, going on without a hitch. Looks like things are going well. So they're up 3.7. XRP, watch out. 63 cents, not too bad. 19% for the week. Can't beat that. Tether is almost at 20 billion. Wow, that's crazy. Litecoin, again, Litecoin holders, you got some strong hands. If you held that for the whole time, you guys are up uh, big time. So good for you guys. Chainlink up to 14. Nah, that's a bummer. I thought it would go up to 15, but uh, hey, I'll take the 14. And Cardano's up 2.8, 20% for the week. And uh, I'll tell you that great story about, <laughs> great story, great story to tell you guys. Not a great story for me. Lost 20,000 uh, Cardano. What a bummer. And then some other cryptocurrencies that are fantastic. And I own some of them, but I don't want to delve on this. Let's just jump into stories today, huh? So first up, this was an interesting story we covered days ago. And this was actually on November 30th. Uh, the China's... Communist Party came in and said, hey, cut off all the electricity of Bitcoin miners. We don't want to deal with them. And I said, I the whole reason for this is uh, the CCP, they can do anything they want to, right? And they will do it. And they pretty much control everything. I mean, I, I don't think anybody can can really dispute that. People that live in China have told me. Uh, people that are have connections over there have told me. And uh, it only makes sense that they do what they want to do. And they rule uh, in, with, with impunity. So that's what they can do. And any miners that reside in China, of course, any mining pools that reside in China, of course, they're doing that. And this is one of those stories. So this all comes down to also a uh, pretty funny exchange between uh, Anthony Pompliano and uh, Ripple's CEO, Brad Garlinghouse, where it, it's, it's just like five seconds. I have to play it. So I always laugh when, when I see it, but it's pretty good. Do you think the Chinese Communist Party could, if they wanted to, control those four miners? No. <laughs> that's always funny i mean every time i see that it's hilarious because brad's like eh, you think you think you're so smart you're not so smart pal it's just it's just a pretty good one and we talked about this in the last video i don't want to beat a dead horse but it was an interesting exchange and there's a lot of a lot of variables and it's not just a cut and dry case it just isn't however i will say this if you look at the the bitcoin mining map this is where all the hash rate resides from and you can see there's a pretty large portion here uh, Asia, a little bit of Australia, South America, North America, not too much, right? Europe. But you can just see right here, as we scroll down, the hash rate, the majority, 65%, is coming from China. The United States is uh, way behind at 7%. Hopefully, Layer 1 can fix that. Uh, that is a, um, a mining organization that's uh, up, popping up in West Texas, where I'm from, or where I'm at, actually. And uh, we'll see how it all works out. But yeah, China does have the lion's share. Now, remember, uh, that is mining pools. And individual miners can connect to those pools and they can change anytime they want to. So uh, there are miners in the U.S. Uh, that connect to these mining pools in China. There are miners, individual miners that 
uh, connect to, uh, you know, wherever they want to go. And that's just how it is. So, but right now the top four pools are definitely in China because they have the cheapest uh, by far uh, electricity. I think it's at less than one cent per kilowatt hour. And that was given to them essentially by the government. They said, hey, we're going to uh, reduce the cost so you guys can mine. Well, now what they're doing, uh, of course, is they're saying, hey, shut it down. We don't want you guys here, which is a pretty crazy thing to think about. Imagine the government came to you and said, hey, we're going to give you a loan uh, to make shirts, right? Great. And there are these great shirts and you're having a great time. and Everything's good. And then like, you know, a couple months later, they go, hey, uh, I want you to give us back uh, all the money and uh, we want you to uh, sell those shirts for a penny. And uh, we don't, we, you can't make any profit and we want you to essentially just go out of business. That's what's coming on here. I mean, it's a loose interpretation, but that's the problem. And it's just a, a very odd thing. And I think the reason that I, I, I saw this happening is because with the digital yuan coming into effect and the success that it's had across the country and in the, in the different provinces, they don't want any competition. So why would they want another type of currency that is harder? that is better, that is decentralized, that is not what they want. They want to control the narrative and that narrative is a digital you want. So Bitcoin, you got to go and they want it out of here and they just don't want to deal with it. I, that's, that's how I think it is. If they wanted to destroy it, uh, as people talk about, I think they would really try to super concentrate everything, you know, just make all these miners, you know, give them even less per kilowatt hour, like maybe like half a cent, uh, you know, 0.25 and say, mine all you want to, bring all the miners in here and then, when we have just the right opportune time, when we have, which they do have 65%, let's just crash the whole network in however way that they can do that. I don't know if they can actually do that, do that, because there are some miners that uh, do definitely uh, watch what is going on at all times. Or they have a monitoring system. So I'm not for sure that they could do it, but people say that they could. So, okay. I personally don't think they can do that, honestly. But I will say this, Brad Smart. And he's almost like a politician. He has these talking points. And if you've heard him make the rounds, he says the same type of thing about China. And it's just an accelerated narrative of what he's already talked about. He's First, he's talked about, look, if you're going to talk about climate control, global warming, that's going to play negatively into the Biden administration because they're going to go after those types of industries. And then he starts to talk about how this China-controlled currency is a detriment to USA and that they really need to take a look at it. Do you really want to support a Chinese currency? And he, and he says these things a lot, a lot, a lot. And it really starts to sink in. It's it's a great marketing ploy. Really, it is. Whether he believes it 100% or not, whether you believe it 100% or not, it still worked out pretty well because guess what happened? Now, US Intel official says, hey, we can't allow China to dominate. And he's talking about digital currencies. So they're going to the first part was with, with, with Bitcoin, and now it's going to go into CBDCs. But it was a great idea just to say that we need to attack this in this specific situation. And it worked out great. And now he's got the ear of the U.S. government. It could really all come down to that or it could come out of something different. But uh, it was great. And we'll go over that in a second. But the one thing that I wanted to go over was the hash rate. So you have to understand that when these miners shut down, uh, this is good for all the other, other miners that are out there. Uh, they can say, hey... We don't have that competition in a whole province of China because they can't mine because they have no electricity. And uh, that's good for them. So the whole network will self-adjust because uh, the less hash rate you have, uh, the, the difficulty starts to adjust a little bit downward. So it's a lot easier for miners to mine Bitcoin when the hash rate starts to decrease, which is the same thing that we saw when we had the halving. Uh, before that, uh, you know, miners really working really hard. Then after the happening for, you know, a couple of months or a couple of weeks or however long it was, they had to shut down because they just weren't profitable. And uh, that was great for all the big corporations or big entities that, that do the mining because they go, great, we have less competition and the difficulty rate is down. So this is fantastic for us. Same thing is happening here. So uh, I just took a look at this, this is from uh, blockchain.com. And you can see this is November 24th. And you, you can see there's pretty massive dips here uh, about what's going on with, with the miners. But there was a massive dip here, November 2nd, and then we're pretty much taking a, a pretty good high right here, November 21st. Now we see a dip. Here's the 29th. Here's the 30th. And that's the day when all the electricity was shut off to these provinces. So you would think, okay, that's what happened. 
we're gonna see a drastic fall in the hash rate. Well, it didn't happen like that because December 1st and today it is December 3rd, right? So it's, it, it's, there's always like a lag of like a 24 to 48 hours, but it actually increased a little bit. So uh, again, this is actually good because then you can distribute this hash rate power to all the different miners and all the different mining pools and it actually works itself out. So that part's great. Now let's get into a problem. And the problem is, is that the US government is now really looking at this as like, hey, this is a national security issue. And this is one of the, the topics that I brought up. If you're gonna have one country who is doing so much of the mining pool, of, of pooling all these miners together, that's a lot of power. No matter how way, uh, any way you shape it uh, or cut, slice and dice, it is a problem. So what's going on here? Well, the director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, contacted SEC Chairman Jay Clayton regarding the matter, which he's talking about CBDCs and Bitcoin, and a senior intelligence official told the Washington, Washington Examiner further details. There are serious national security concerns about China's control over Bitcoin and Ether. So beautifully played. Brad was making the rounds. He was talking to people. But it's not just that. They have a lobbying group in Washington, which is one of the things that the, the kudos that I give to Ripple to actually put that forward and actually go to these uh, legislatures and go and, uh, and say, hey, uh, we have an issue. We want to get uh, blockchain uh, cryptocurrency digital assets uh, into the the public consciousness and have you guys vote on this. Here's what we'd like to see. And they open the discussion, which is great. But doing that, they can bend the ear and go, look, if you want to deal with a Chinese cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin, then be on, be my guest. Whether that be right or wrong or whatever else, else it is, it's again, it's a great play. So the bottom line is that we cannot allow China to dominate the technologies and innovations that are going to decide who runs the world for decades to come, from AI to digital currency and everything in between. And when we're talking about AI and we're talking about cryptocurrencies and, and blockchains, and we're talking about the actual what is going to run the world, we're really looking at the uh, industrial revolutions. So you know you have your your agricultural uh, revolution, which is in the uh, 1800s. Then you have the industrial revolution, 1920s, 1930s. You had the internet revolution in the early 90s and 2000s. And each stage of those, different countries started to take effect and really take power. America, they got into the industrial revolution and took over. And then from there, they also uh, made a great play and went to the internet revolution and they dominated that. Now, who is going to dominate the next one with artificial intelligence, with blockchain, and these digital currencies? That is a real question because that's going to, what's going to determine who's going to run the world in the next 20 to 50 years. So Ratcliffe's concern relates to the fact that 65% of Bitcoin miners located in China. This is the exact same thing that we just looked, we just took a look at. He says, but what of a nation state attack? Could the Chinese government have a worrying influence on Bitcoin through these miners? The worst case scenario is that the government seizes all of the mining equipment and they definitely could do that at any time. But even in that event, the repercussions are limited, as pointed out by Bitcoin engineer Jameson Loop. Bitcoin network operates well enough that uh, any suspicious activity is immediately detected. I, I, I beg to differ on that one. I, I don't think that every single miner is uh, monitoring what's going on. I think things could uh, you know, actually happen and they'd be like, what happened? Because you know, they're gonna mine a block every 10 minutes. Hey, if things get reversed or transactions uh, get flubbed, maybe they miss that that block and they go on. Again, I'm not a miner. I'd asked I asked Boss Can uh, Boss Coin. Uh, he's another YouTuber to come on. Hey, the guy's really busy. He hasn't made it yet, but hopefully he gets on here. But they state seizure of these mining resources would only result in short-term outages that would see the equipment rendered in ineffective. And, and I'm think he's talking about a, a mass scale. What we just saw actually was good for a lot of miners like we just talked about. So I think it was actually, it was a good thing. And we just saw that that hash rate actually uh, increased. But what about central bank digital coins and general innovation? Here, China has more influence only because it is taking steps to innovate. The country has already run multiple research and development initiatives, leaving others behind. And that's the truth. And this is why they're doing it. Chinese Premier Xi Jinping has been a FinTech, a key area of his agenda. As, a, as revealed by the digital yuan's documentation. And that 300 million figure is indeed impressive for the short time that the pilot has been active, but that's the overall strategy. To, it includes logistics, administration, and smart cities. So what they know, they're like, look, 
if we can lock this down as far as blockchain technology, because he's even come on and said, like, look, I'm not about Bitcoin, but I'm all about blockchain. And they're going heavy into it. So, And they're also doing that and researching new artificial intelligence. If they dominate that, China dominates the world. And that is a fact, Jack. Lastly, Goldman Sachs predicted that digital yuan could reach 1 billion users by the end of the decade. That's not too far away. At the current pace of China's competitors, that could very well be the case. So, I mean, if we think about 10-year increments, as I get older, time just goes by like in an instant. So when I see about 10 years, I mean, 10 years to start to dominate the entire global landscape, it's it's in a blink of an eye. And it can happen a lot faster than uh, you know we realize. So that is what is going on with Bitcoin miners. But looking at uh, the entire global picture, it's a much bigger game. And there's a lot of at stake. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Let's move on. So before we get to how I lost 20,000 Cardano, uh, this is just a quick follow-up to a story we did a couple days ago about gold being put into Bitcoin. Uh, this was a quick um, interview from, it was Raul Powell to MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor. And in here, Raul, we already know that he's actually taken all his gold and put it into Bitcoin, which is a pretty ballsy move, honestly. I don't think he should have done that. I'm not going to do that. I still have gold. I still have silver. And I still have Bitcoin. I just have a lot more Bitcoin than I do gold and silver because there's just more upside potential. But um, what you're going to hear here is people have all have told me that, no, 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 nobody is getting rid of their gold bullion. They're not taking out their, their uh, safes. They're not melting it down. They're not physically bringing it in. And uh, I'm here to tell you, here's a couple of points where that's not true. People are actually doing that. So just take a listen. $250 trillion <laughs> worth of stuff. This is not about gold, right? Gold, fixed income, sovereign debt, cash equivalents. Every other treasury asset's got a negative real yield. What am I going to buy with it? No, there's no other asset to buy with it. And that's why I got into the irresponsibly long thing. In the end, I just looked at everything and said, right, fine. You can trade around, do stuff. But if there's anything you actually want to put a real position in for an extended period of time, that there is only one thing I can really see. You know, I've, I've got gold in a storage vault, and I'm like... I've got gold in a storage vault. So if he had gold in a storage vault, and he got rid of all his gold, even if he did have ETFs, he still had to sell his physical gold. That's, that's all I'm saying. So there's that. And it's a pretty great interview, but it's long. It's like two hours. But uh, in one of those, Michael talks about uh, how he just doesn't doesn't respect traders. He goes, why would you trade this asset? It is so valuable. He goes, it's going to shake up the whole world. It's going to control everything. He goes, you don't want to sell any of this. He goes, you can take a loan out on it. He goes, but uh, don't sell any of it because it's, you know, the things you're selling it for are worthless. And I thought that was a pretty good point. So there's this piece here. And then and a subscriber, Brian, had actually sent that to me and he timestamped everything. So thank you, Brian. I really appreciate it. I got to tell you, I've got a lot of smart, uh, really dedicated subscribers. So I thank you for watching right now and for, for you commenting and, and for you sending me stuff. I appreciate it. But Brian says, hey, uh, on top of what he sent me, he goes, a lot of people are definitely selling physical gold and silver and rolling those dollars into Bitcoin. I'm one of them. Uh, I've sold off 7,000 ounces of physical silver over the last three months. Sell order emails attached, sure, and reallocated those funds to Bitcoin. My friends have made the same move with their physical gold and silver holdings. People are underestimating the outflows from metals to Bitcoin cryptos, just another legacy sector, denying obvious changes coming. So really, I'm just going to say like this. Um, I would think that if you saw the upside potential for Bitcoin, you'd be like, wow, well, gold can't go up 10x, but Bitcoin can. And also Ethereum can go up, you know, 20, 30 X and also V chain can go up hundred whatever it is, right? You might want to say, I'm going to, you know, decrease my position in gold and then go this other way. Is, is gold bad? No, I own gold. I own silver. And it's like the ultimate hedge. It's been around for thousands of years. So I think if you're looking to, you know, really hedge your bet, then, you know, get into all three. I always say that the new savings account is gold, silver, Bitcoin. I know gold bugs who have come on the channel, they <laughs> they hate my channel because I'm always talking about cryptocurrencies, but I don't really tell them the whole story. And that is that there is still a place for gold. Uh, there is. It's not going to go away. It's been around for thousands of years. It'll, be still, it'll still be around when I'm gone. And um, I still think there's a place for it. However, uh, if it's all about what you want to do with it. And I think if you're looking for those asymmetrical returns, uh, you have to take a, a hard look 
at Bitcoin and get into it. Um, I just don't see any other way around it. But let me know what you think in the comments section and uh, let's uh, move on. So real quick, as I play this video in the background, I lost 20,000 uh, Cardano. And the way I did it was because I had written down on a nice piece of paper, the Daedalus wallet, uh, the testnet, <laughs> the testnet uh, passphrase. And I'd written those 24 words down and I'd put it in a, because I used to just put everything on pieces of paper. And this was like one of my first uh, wallets that I had because Binance was, this was back in the day when Binance used to let Americans on. And then they said, no, we are not gonna allow you to. So that's where I got my first Cardano. So I had to take everything off. And the only place I could find to, to put it was in a deadless wallet, but that was in the test net. So I had a bunch of different papers and I could have sworn I put them here in my Houston home. And when we came back uh, three weeks ago, I was looking everywhere for it. I could not find that paper. I found it for a lot of other worthless, <laughs> worthless cryptocurrencies, but they're all gone. And if I just would have known about Shieldfolio, I would have, which is where I have all, all of my passphrases now. I actually have two books. One is at my house in El Paso. The other one is in a safety or security box in, in my bank because I have them all backed up. But the one that I never did was Cardano because I knew I had it here in Houston and I would get it back, but I've been over there for like nine months because the coronavirus and it's gone and uh, you, you can't get it back because remember, this is the Daedalus wallet that was in the test net. And once it went live to the main net, I was like, ah, I'll get to it later. Never, never did, never can, and it's gone. So cautionary tale, um, get a shield folio. Uh, it's, it's, if you use my link in the com in the description, get 20% off. I use them, they're great. Like, like you just watch the video, it's uh, tear proof and waterproof. It's not fireproof, but it's, you know, pretty, pretty darn tough uh, type of uh, booklet. And it's just right there. And it kind of like just reminds you. So uh, don't lose 20,000 Cardano. That's the big story. All right, so uh, that's it for tonight. I'll be traveling tomorrow, but I'll see you guys on Saturday. And that's it. So thanks for sticking with me through the whole video. I appreciate it. If you like these types of videos, me two more it's gonna pop up on your left and right not sure let youtube do their magic there and uh that is it so thanks a bunch uh, i'll see you on the next one bye